You know, Gloria brought up a good point about specific praying. Um, and don't take this wrong from me or Gloria, but maybe you can identify with this. Maybe it's a non-issue for you. But I think it's a, a good illustration in application. Um, I don't do well with prayer lists because I don't know quite what to do with them. I, I pray through them. So when I get the one from the church each week, I kind of look down through it. But as Gloria and I was talking about, man, there are an awful lot of names on there. Number one, I don't even know the person. Two, the ones I know, I'm not sure even what I'm praying for or what they need. And that's not a challenge to change the prayer list. I don't think most people want their specific needs put down on a piece of paper and sent wirelessly through the Internet somewhere. I'm not suggesting we change that. But it does help when we get specific information. I had uh, a lot of people in the church that I pastored in Kentucky who would come to me, mostly females, saying, would you please pray for my husband? What do you want me to pray for? Uh, well, he's not saved. So is it okay if I pray for him to lose his job so that he would get so desperate he would have to turn to God? Well, no, I don't want you praying for that. Well, then you tell me, how am I supposed to pray for him? And, and there's nothing wrong with saying, would you please introduce yourself to this man and give him an opportunity? I don't mind praying that way. Uh, but there are times when it's really, really helpful, and maybe this is for the friend. It's not for the general public. But if, if you've put someone on that list or you're on that list ever, then find two or three trustworthy people and say, here's what specifically I'm asking you to pray for. Um, you know, even in the, in the hospital, I would go pray with people uh, and I would ask them, how do you want me to pray? And, you know, just they, they would act like I've never heard that question before. I don't know. And I'm not saying they know. We've just acknowledged we don't know the what sometimes to ask for. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, well, please, God, just bless this person in their distress or greet them in their joy right now and bring celebration from heaven for their good news. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm talking about when we're on the other end, if we want people to pray for us, the, the thing that I, I, again, in Wednesday night prayer meetings, which in, in that church people for the first three years were very offended at because we actually prayed. Oh, yeah. No, we, pray you to, we pay you to bring three sermons a week. What do you mean you're not bringing a sermon on Wednesday night? You know, you had one Sunday night back then and Sunday morning. No, we, we call this prayer meeting. We're praying here. We're not doing Bible study. We're not doing sermons. But when we prayed, we, we tried to be as specific as we could be. And when the old silent request hands went up, my head just went down. I thought, oh, my gosh. I, I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to be insensitive at all and temperament maybe no one as you have found out has ever accused me of having the gift of mercy so I know that's not my strong suit but at the same time when you and I are on the needy end let's find at least a few people to be as specific as we can with Here, here's what I really would like for you to pray for now it may not be what I need but it's what I think I need but will you take this to the father with me so I think any of those kinds of things as specific as we can be are as helpful as possible when we're praying. And don't think twice about asking someone, how do you want me to pray for you? And join them in that prayer until God changes the prayer, right? Yes, ma'am. Valerie. I think one of the advantages to that too is, is that because you're praying for something very specific, it almost forces you to follow up with that person on a regular and consistent basis to say, should I change my prayer? Is that prayer being answered? Is there a different way you want me to pray? Very it, it, it really, it's not a prayer said and done. Yes. It's one that you, and they know it's the top of your mind and it becomes important to them. Yes. So I, I think not only is it good for them, but it's also good for you because it reinforces that relationship. Great, great point, great point. Because we are making connection with God, but we're also making eternal connections with one another, aren't we? We're, we're entering into a relationship with other people. The other thing that I suggest on, on prayer lists, uh, you know, I read through them all, every, every name on there. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but often I'm just looking for the one that kind of jumps out at me. You know, the, the name, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm, I'm believing, I'm trusting God put that on my heart. I, I don't know that with absolute certainty, but we're making faith choices, right? 
So when someone's name jumps out at me, I'm going to pause on that particular name. And I'm going to either do one of two things or both. I'm going to pray specifically, Lord, is there something you can give me insight on, on, on this? And more often than not, I'm going to pick up a phone and call somebody. I'm going to say, you're on the list. How can I pray for you? I keep a personal prayer list all the time for me because mm -hmm. otherwise I feel like, um, it, I mean, it helps me to stay focused on that person and knowing what that person is going through in their life at this moment and, and praying. Plus, I keep it recorded and I, I periodically will go back and look and it will bring me great joy to see how God's worked in those prayer requests. Yeah, I've got some of those from decades ago yeah. that every now and then, it's almost, you know, we'll talk about it in a minute, but you know, do you know what an Ebenezer is? You used to sing the song, I will raise mine Ebenezer. Flag. It's a flag or a pile of rocks. An Ebenezer is a pile of rocks. So when God did something, they were to put up a pile of rocks, so every time they walked past that pile, they could tell their children, this is where God stepped in and helped us. This is where God did something that we couldn't do for ourselves. And I've got my Ebenezers, <laughs> you know, those places where every now and then you think, gosh, I, I don't know if this is worth it or working or whatever. Then you go back and say, well, look what he did here. Look what he did here. Look at the difference. That's a good word. how faithful God is. Good reminder. Good reminder. Thank you. All right. Let's look at uh, session number three. And if someone will turn to, well, we can all turn to Luke chapter 18. But I'd like for somebody to read. There's eight verses there. Um, it's a parable. And you have to be careful about making too many points from a parable. There's usually a main point, but there are some things that I think will kind of jumpstart us into this next realm uh, because it's uh, 18, 1 through 8. 18, 1 through 8, it should say. I don't know what your outline says. You know, I don't know anybody yet who's mastered praying. I think we are always coming to God as little children when we're praying. I want to be real cautious about approaching God as if I've got this figured out. <laughs> you know, unless you come to me as a little child, I do believe God's growing us up in 1 John 2 from little children to young men to spiritual mothers and fathers. There's a clear intent of God in maturing us, but it seems to me in prayer we're always coming to God as little children. I'm trusting that you know. There you go. All right. I'm trusting you know better than me. Uh, and in the Bible, Old Testament and New, it's not something we master. Prayer is never something we master. It's just something that God invites us to do. It's expected. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you pray, don't do this. When you pray, do this. It wasn't even a, a discussion or a debate. It's just what people, uh, the people of God do. And most of our praying, and this, this is going to sound... Well, I don't care how it sounds. Most of our praying is done by praying. That's how we learn. Not by this. Okay, we can get jump started, get a new idea, maybe get a spirit motivation for digging in a little deeper. But we learn to pray by praying. Not by discussing and not by studying and not by debating what works and what doesn't. So the question from Jesus here, if you look in verse 1, then I want somebody to read all eight verses for it. Are you going to pray or are you going to lose heart? Those are the two options in this parable. Okay? Would someone like to read those eight verses for us? Miss Linda, thank you. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? All right. Be careful how you interpret quickly. 
if a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day to the Lord, just be real careful about how we interpret quickly, okay? This is the parable of the unjust judge, and there's one thing about parables. Uh, sometimes they are parables and stories of comparison. Sometimes they are parables and stories of contrast. Be careful about misunderstanding this one. This is a parable of contrast. He's basically saying if the unrighteous judge does this, then what do you think in contrast the righteous father is going to do? All right. We want to kind of look at it through that lens for a minute, because what this judge is, God isn't. And Jesus is using this as incentive and invitation to be humble and bold in our praying. We're not going to build a prayer model on if we just keep begging and pestering and harassing God, eventually He will give in and give us what we want. That is not the point of this parable. The point of this parable is we're praying to someone very different than an unrighteous or unjust God. An unjust, unholy judge, he doesn't really care about this woman's needs. He doesn't even care about justice. He just wants to get somebody off his back. That's about as far from our God as we're going to get. He needed to be begged with. He needed to be pled. He needed to be harassed over and over again. I know you've been around me enough. I read between the lines. Not everybody is expected to see what I see between the lines. I see this guy waiting for a bribe. She comes, she comes, she comes, she comes, she comes. Well, when's this coming? When's this coming? Then maybe I can give you what you want. The woman in this story is seeking legal protection. Oh, listen, you don't ever want to pray God and say, give me what I've got coming to me. <laughs> Do not make that a model for praying to God. <laughs> I want fair. Poof, you're gone. There's fair. All right? But she's begging legal protection. She doesn't have anybody to plead her case. She is all on her own. And finally, this judge didn't know her at all. What's the contrast? Why would, I don't know about you, I could lose heart really easily with a God like that. You can't ever please Him. You're expected to plead your own performance before you can get anything from Him. Whatever the case is you see there, what about our God? He's just, He's holy. We don't have to beg Him. He invites us. Isn't that where we started? Prayer is always responsive. It's God's amazing grace that says, Call unto me, come to me freely. If we're smart, we never plead legal rights before God. We're pleading grace, aren't we? Over and over. Grace, grace, grace. I know I don't deserve this. I, I know I haven't earned it. I haven't acted like it all week. <laughs> But I can still pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And even if I can't figure it out, where did we start in Romans chapter 8? I have a divine advocate who's in me who can't even, I don't even know how to put the words together, God, but he can make the desires of my heart known to you in a way that are very clear to you. And he knows God's will. And he knows the will of the Father. And what about my Father? He knows me by name. Do you see the contrast? This woman has to beg and plead and harass. We freely get to step into the throne room of God and let our requests be made known to Him. There's your incentive. This is a God who wants to have a relationship with you and me. Knocking on the door of our hearts, saying, let me in. Okay, let's go to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 31. So if someone would read that for us. There is a clear difference before wailing... <laughs> W-A-I-L-I-N-G, wailing because of what's going on and waiting upon God because of what's going on or not going on. But would someone read 
27 through 31. Would somebody else read it? Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Okay, stop right there just a second. That's their prayer. God heard their prayer. God, are you hiding yourself from us? What, what about the justice that you say belongs to your people? Why does that escape your notice? And then God answers, verse 28 and following. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks, might he increase pow increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. All right. He's setting up another contrast here for us. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, affliction, disappointment, friction, setback, bad news. And if all we do is stay stuck right here, complaining and wailing and griping, again, we get to do that honestly. We get to, Jeremiah, God, you seduced me. <laughs> you brought me into this, and now look at the mess you've got me into. I, I just find that to be such a potent and honest prayer. We get to acknowledge all of this, but we pour it into the infinite love of God, and we wait upon God who knows what we need and back to when we need it. And this is Him teaching us that I am the Lord of your supply and I am the Lord of time. You don't get to determine those things. That belongs to me. The waiting ones end up with God's patience and with God's strength. Look what He says in verse 31. Those who wait upon the Lord, and we're going to equate that with praying for the moment. They have perspective. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Now we think that's the result of a life that is in touch with God. Now, he gives us that idea that we can, you know, an eagle gets high up. You get an eagle perspective. You, you, you see things differently than if you're right here on the ground behind a rock. <laughs> so. Yes, I will give you something of this eternal perspective, which He's revealed to us. I'm using the all things of your life to shape you into the likeness of my Son. So nothing you're going through right now is wasted. Praying faithfully, praying without losing heart, keeps us in this eternal perspective. We get a little glimpse every now and then of what God's up to and what He's doing. And even through the veil that we call time and space, that if I don't get to see it here, that my God at some point in the future, at the consummation of the ages, is going to bring this all the way into the fullness of the ultimate intention He had before the very first let there be. And then every now and then, that's enough to get through the day, isn't it? <laughs> It's not going the way I want here, but it's always going the way God works through here. So we get that eternal perspective for those who wait upon the Lord. We get crisis energy. They will run and not get tired. When do you run? In a crisis. <laughs> you try to run to something. You try to run away from something. There are moments when we get from God, from above, a supernatural, let's just call it energy. I am absolutely flat, worn out. I am tired. Go back to five kids, three and under, one of them handicapped. You don't know if he's going to live or not. You just, your whole world is upside down, topsy-turvy. And yet, every day, you get some other gift of grace from God to get through it, to walk through it. And trust me, we needed it more with five teenagers than five little kids. There is a God. So we get crisis energy from time to time. You all have been there illness, setback, a phone call in the middle of the night you never wanted to get. And you're in a crisis, and somehow or another, God has given you the energy to get through it. But look at the last one. They walk and do not become weary. 
There's the daily strength. There's the stamina. Most of life down here below this line is not soaring with eagles. It's not running with crisis energy. It's a daily plod with God. <laughs> You're just taking the next step, aren't you? God, I'm trusting you for this. I'm trusting you in this. I don't know how to manage this, but you do. I can't love this person, but you can. But if we will let the Spirit take our legitimate wailing and complaining and gripes with God and let Him transform that into waiting upon the Lord, here's our promise. This is why we do not faint. This is why we do not lose heart. This is why we do not give up hope. Because we are trusting when I need the eternal perspective, God will give me a glimpse of that. When I'm in need of energy to get through this crisis, it's something I can't manufacture, but God can grace to me. And when I just need to see a, just enough light to take the next step, I'm trusting it will be there when my foot hits the ground. This is praying without ceasing. Wail to your heart's content, but wail to your heavenly Father. Complain all you want, acknowledge every weakness, confess every time you miss the mark, and let it be an escort into the ability of our God to do what we cannot. Do you understand a little bit then why the psalmist would say in Psalm 118, 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. And because of this, I can rejoice and be glad in it. Because in the story of a changed life of a son or daughter of God, absolutely nothing is wasted. Is there heartbreak? Most days. Are there things that get us angry? Yes. Ephesians 4.24, we have divine permission to be angry. Be angry, but sin not. Right? Anger is the sound that God's voice is making, calling us into the gift of His character to meet the need of the moment. When you see life with the eyes of God, it all starts becoming prayer. Take out your prayer guide. Let's look at session prayer number three. I don't think it has the scripture at the bottom by the other two, but the scripture is the one we just read from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, 27 through 31, if you need to pencil that in there. <clears throat> but let's pray. Let's pray this one together, and then we'll look at some hindrances and helps and, and be on our way to lunch. Ready? O oh Lord, how long? I know it sounds like I do a lot of complaining and whining, but in times like this, it seems like you don't really care what's happening to me. Did I get lost in the crowd of needy people? Are you tired of me? It's not fair. Where is your justice when I need it? Why aren't you working in my life like you promised? Quiet. Say la. Quiet. Wait a minute. Take a deep breath. What? What is that you're saying? That you are the everlasting one? That you, the creator and recreator of all? That you do not take days off? That you do not grow tired? That you lose sight of none who belong to you? That you know full well what you're doing even when I don't? That you give strength to the weary, energy to the worn out? That in a world where even the young and strong stumble and fall, you are at work issuing command invitations to seek you, hope in you, wait upon you, because you always come through. So is that it? 
that weariness and fatigue and stumbling are a part of the journey, that part where you teach us to trustfully wait for you to grace us with your eternal perspective, your crisis energy, your moment-by-moment -moment strength for the day we're in, that your gifts are not for the wailing or whining ones, but for the waiting ones, well then, so be it. I will wait for you to anchor me in your unseen reality. Amen and amen. Take that for about two weeks and see if you don't start telling a little bit different story about the world we live in. The facts don't change, but facts don't set people free. Truth. The facts will press you escort you, lift you up into the truth. All right, let's look at some of the hindrances and some of the helps. And, and I, I use these cautiously because, and I've saved them to this point because I don't want them to be our focus. As I said, we, we have a command invitation from God to every son and daughter of God, you step into my presence anytime, anywhere, any place, any condition. You have unhindered access. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We enter boldly into the throne room of grace. We don't need a pass. We don't need an invitation. I'm convinced that thank God for everything, that verse in Ephesians 5.20, could be a password into the deepest portals that are God's, but we don't even need to do that. We can come in wailing and whining as long as we take it to Him. Let's just look at some of the scriptural ideas of um, hindrances first, and, and you just do a little checklist before the Holy Spirit. Okay, if, if any of these are applying to me, I'm trusting you to point them out. Don't go looking for this stuff. You'll have more help than you need. The accuser of the brethren will tell you, well, that just described you. No wonder nothing ever happens in your life when you pray. You might run out of ink. Run out of ink. Just Holy Spirit, I'm presenting myself to you right now. If there's something here that's blocking my ability to pray with prayer. Remember our line from James? To pray, pray ye. Speak to me. Let's start with the obvious. In James chapter 4, verse 2, you have not because you ask not. And I, I know that you think, well, that doesn't apply to me, and I'm not trying to play Holy Spirit. It may not. But there are times when we are so self-reliant, we believe I can handle this on my own. Right? And I haven't even stopped to say, God, I need you. I, I, I don't want to know sometimes what God wants me to do. <laughs> I'm going to handle this the way I've always handled it. The second thing James says in the third verse is you have not because you ask amiss. Your reason is misaligned with God's purposes. You might, I might just be asking for a selfish reason. Believe me, I don't think relief is selfish. But at the same time, when I want relief more than I want what God wants, it's amazing the ungodly offers we're vulnerable to. Distractions, dulling agents, soothing mechanisms, buying things that we don't really need or can't afford, a trip because that'll make me better, a new fly rod, I can go six months off of that. Right? Sometimes we're asking amiss. There's nothing wrong with starting there. But every now and then, again, I get a sense that the prayer isn't getting past my head, top of my bald head up here, or it's not getting through the roof. I'm going to step back and say, am I asking for something that's not in line with what you're doing here? That's not a bad question to ask. I'm willing to be shown. We just read from Isaiah 40, 31, <clears throat> a demand for immediacy. Now mark that word demand. Legitimate desires can be hardened into illegitimate demands. God, relief right now, I've had enough. That's a legitimate desire. There's nothing selfish about that. But if I let that demand, that, that desire harden into a demand, and I am demanding to God, the minute I'm demanding anything to God, I'm in trouble. How about double-mindedness? We mentioned that earlier from James 1.8. Don't expect the double-minded man to receive anything from God. 
I have sat in the counseling room with way too many people in the last 45 years who are in distress down here and they want to come to counseling and they want to pray so they can discover what their options are. And they're reserving the right to choose which option. You have to be very careful with that. We talked about presenting ourselves in a non-selective readiness to God. And what you reveal to me, I will do the next thing. So when someone has been hurt, offended, and, and meanly so, or, or unrighteously so, you know, again, legitimate hurt can harden into illegitimate demand for revenge, if you're not careful for getting even. And so there are times when it's very easy for us uh, to say, I want to know what my options are here, God. And when someone, when God does point out, let's just say all of a sudden Ephesians 4, 32 comes to life, 33. I want you to forgive just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now we want to step back and discuss the wounds for another six weeks. Let me tell you how bad it was. Let me tell you everything they did to me. And I'm not discounting pain, emotional memories, things that are attached to legitimate hurt in our life. I don't think God rarely pushes an erase button and gets rid of all those. He'd rather buy it up and convert it into ministry so that when you meet someone else who's been hurt, you know how to sit with them in their pain. But at the same time, if I'm just listening to God or even someone else for the purpose of only discovering my options, then it's going to be really hard to get I think a clear hearing of what God might be saying to us. We get a wrong view of God. The scripture is loaded with that. I mentioned Psalm 50, 21 earlier. This is one many, many years ago that, um, again, just shook me to the core. Psalm 50, 21 says, These things you've done and I've kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. Every now and then the God to whom we pray is just our own alter ego. We want somebody to, with power to do what we would do if we were God. You thought I was just like you. No, I'm not thinking through this like you. I'm not in anything like you. God is in a category unto Himself. Holy, transcendent, unlike any other. And we are deriving from Him. So let's be careful about this view of God. We mentioned a vending machine in the sky, or God's this evil taskmaster that you can never do enough to please. He's this distant, uncaring overlord who expects unrealistic things out of me, uh, even though I'm dying down here in the circumstances I'm in. If we're not careful there, God... Someone said it earlier, God can be speaking, but we're just not hearing. We've kept the soulish pain so loud inside of us that we can't even hear the still, small voice of God. When I did some work in the refugee camps of the Middle East back in the 70s, um, these, these were people who had legitimate hurt and, and generational pain from the suffering that goes on between, let's just say, Arabs and Jews at the moment. And the people here, because so many of them would not listen to the voice of love, developed tremendous survival skills. And you have not seen survival skills till you've been in a refugee camp somewhere. They make for terrible relational skills, don't they? And so when you and I have been through disappointment, abuse, trauma, someone's improperly touched us, and again, I'm not talking just sexual. It, it can just be they never connected with us emotionally. We had parents that weren't emotionally available to us or whatever the case may have been. And we bring that touchiness into the church. And we talk about how uncaring and how unloving and how impossible it is to get along with church people. And I'd be a whole lot better off doing church out in the woods on Sunday or in my lazy boy not having to face these difficult people, then our survival skills remain intact, but we rarely get set free. So God puts us into a family, a covenant family, with people that don't think like we do. Their preferences don't line up with ours. They don't do Christianity on our terms because He's pressing us from survival skills into spirit-given relational skills. But if we're got a wrong view of God, we're in trouble. A one-dimensional, one-sided 
form of praying. Psalm 106, 13, I will read that. You can follow with the other ones later. But in Psalm 106, 13, they quickly forgot His works, His being God. They did not wait for His counsel. This is almost like an immediacy thing. We pour it out into God, but we don't sit still and listen for the truth of God to speak to us. Verse 25 of that same chapter, they grumbled in their tents, just got stuck down here in the things below, grumbling, grumbling, grumbling about how hard it was, and they did not listen to the voice of the Lord. One of the reasons we don't listen to the voice of the Lord is because our grumbling is drowning out His voice. Grumble and leave it. Pour it into the infinite love of God and leave it. And maybe the number one thing are just all the substitutes. The books about prayer, the prayer plans. In church we've been taught mostly to listen to the voice of man so sermons can get in the way of praying the prayer. I really think it's a sad commentary when people say, well, I go to church every week to get my word from God. I think that's a sad, sad commentary about life that has learned to hear the voice of man but not tune in to the voice of God. So be careful of substitutes. We love to read books about praying. It's just tougher sometimes to pray, isn't it? All right. I'm not playing Holy Spirit here, but if you've asked the Holy Spirit, it may, you, something may have jumped out at you. It may come out in the days to come. This is simple to deal with. Yes, sir, I believe you. <laughs> that has been a hindrance. Thank you for making me consciously aware of it. Right? Okay, it's been there. And I just thought that's the way it was. But now you've made me consciously aware of it. How about some of the helps then? Obviously, they'd be the opposite of some of these things. A God reliance. Um, a dependency, a derivativeness. I don't have anything that I've not gotten from God, and my life comes from here. I don't generate anything that's Christian, not a single thing. I've received everything pertaining to life and godliness. I didn't learn it. I didn't wrap my brain around it. I didn't apply willpower. Boy, effectual prayers are in a constant state of dependency or derivativeness. I can't do this, but I know who can. I tell you, when your prayers will make a quantum leap is we pray less and less for ourselves and more for the needs of other people. Start being other interested. Because this life who lives in you is for others. There's nothing wrong with praying for ourselves. We're going to do that before we leave here today. But let's do a little bit less of that and a little bit more of for others. And watch the life who is for others start making himself known more clearly to us. How about submitting, waiting upon the Lord of time? If that's a concept you're struggling getting your mind around, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We won't do it today. But get immersed in that for a couple of weeks. Read it a little bit every couple of days. There's a time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that. And then he concludes it in verse 11 by saying, what? Everything he makes perfect in his time? <laughs> so I want to learn the rhythms of God's grace and spirit people who are moving from spiritual infancy to young adulthood to spiritual maturity are people who are learning to operate by God's clock, God's timing. And Betty, as you keep saying, that doesn't mean it's always going to happen on my time. I'm not always going to see it. That is so true. How about a single-mindedness? Seek first the kingdom of God. Paul's letter to the Philippians, this one thing I do. A one thing, single-mindedness. Boy, if you know God is love, that's a different way to pray. He's not that scorekeeper in the sky. He's the father, the friend, the lover. Sometimes we don't do a lot of listening. There's not much dialogue in our praying. The whole Psalm 46, 10 idea, be still and know that I'm God. 
You know, that's a rebuke. The way that's written in Hebrew, it's a rebuke. It's one of those onomatopoeia things in, in Hebrew. Hush! Hush! Shut up! Stop it! Just learn to be still and present yourself in loving attentiveness to me. We say, well, that sure seems like a waste of time. My minutes are very valuable. I'm just not going to sit here for three minutes pretending like you're in the room. You tell me, is it ever a waste of time for a mother to hold a newborn baby in her arms even though no words are being communicated at all? Or husband and wife, lovers, lying in the silent embrace of just a physical union? There's all kinds of things being communicated there that go beyond words, aren't there? It may seem like a waste of time to us, but one of the ways you learn to get in rhythm with the Lord of time is to be still. Silence. Solitude. You're not trying to produce anything. This is my hardest task with young preachers. One of the hardest things that I have to get them to do. Be still before God and not listen for what He'll preach. Because now we're trying to use God. We don't know it, but we're trying to use God. I, you got to take notes every time something comes to you. No, just be still. I, I want you to take just three minutes a day. Just three. Set a little egg timer. Be still. Present yourself in loving attentiveness to God. Watch your spiritual sensors start being fine-tuned to things that are going on all the time that you don't know anything about because you're so trapped down here. You're so worried about what people are going to think regarding your sermon and Sunday, all you can think about is what will preach. You're not even really thinking about God anymore. And of course, the last one is praying. <laughs> praying. Praying according to the will of God. Praying in the name of Christ. We've already talked about that. 